Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voice and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And I have a returning guest, uh, Mark Gober. And Mark has a new book out called The End of Upside Down Thinking. And he was on our podcast before. And for all of you listeners, uh, he has, a, I'm sorry, End of Upside Down Living. The uh, prior book was The End of Upside Down Thinking. Uh, we will have a link to both of those books in the podcast. Um, you can get this book at Amazon in a hardcover, or you can get it as a Kindle book. Good day to you, Mark. How are you doing? I'm well, Greg. Thanks for having me again. Ah, it's good to see you. It's uh, good to see you're back on the West Coast. Uh, last time I talked to Mark, he was in New York. So um, today he's here. And, <clears throat> you know, I've been a big fan of yours, and I want to let the listeners know a bit about your website as well. There it is, website. Um, you can see Mark. Uh, he play, has a great little video uh, that tells about how he got where he is today with relation to uh, his journey, not only writing these books, uh, but with uh, the journey toward consciousness. Mark is the author of award-winning book, The End of Upside Down Thinking, 2018, and the sequel, uh, An End of Upside Down Living. He's also the best, he is also the host of Where Is My Mind? It's a podcast he started in 2019, featuring his interviews with world-leading consciousness researchers, uh, Eben Alexander, Dean Radin, and many others. Um, he just really is a fascinating guy, and I think we'll just get right into it because uh, this book deserves it. Now, Mark, in the preface of your book, um, you state that how we intend to live is the essential guiding force behind the life we do live. Um, can you inform the listeners a little about how you got where you are with this book. I think your video does a great job, not only this book, but the prior book, just your journey. And how would you kind of inform listeners or at least guide listeners about how they could live their life more in intentionally? Sure. So my background on the surface has nothing to do with consciousness. Uh, I graduated from Princeton. I wasn't thinking about these topics then, went into investment banking, and that was actually during the financial crisis, 2008 to 2010. I was there in New York and left to join a Silicon Valley-based strategy firm advising tech companies, and I spent 10 years there, became a partner. It was in 2016 that I was listening to podcasts, mostly on business and health topics, and I came across what some would call anomalies in consciousness, meaning things like telepathic effects or people claiming they could communicate with the deceased, things that sound very paranormal. And at first I didn't think too much of it because people were talking about their own anecdotal accounts of this happened to me and, and I, would, I couldn't validate what they were saying. But then I, I was interested enough to start looking at the science behind it and saw that there was actual science coming from not only the US government, but also the University of Virginia, Princeton University, the Institute of Noetic Sciences and many other places. So that led me on a journey to reconsider reality and um, tr ask deep questions like, who am I? What am I doing here? Is there any meaning to my life beyond what I'm making of it? Is there intrinsic meaning in the universe and in my life and in the lives of others? And uh, that led me to write my first book, An End to Upside Down Thinking, which I wrote the first draft of a year after starting my research. So it was in the summer of 2017 then began to interview many of the scientists that I wrote about and, and came up with the podcast, Where Is My Mind, which you mentioned, it's an eight episode series that concluded in 2019 and goes through many of these topics. And then uh, this, in late 2019, I decided to leave my, my firm where I had spent 10 years and um, just didn't feel as aligned as I used to and wanted to pursue these other topics full time. And then Shortly after that, ended up writing the second book and ended up upside down living. And the focus of that book, as you were alluding to, is, is looking at how we can come up with a basically a guiding compass for our lives. What is it in our lives that drives our actions, our priorities, and our values? And if I had tried to answer that question several years ago before I began this journey, I would have said it's kind of a meaningless exercise because 
we are creatures of randomness, basically, that there was a big bang almost 14 billion years ago and lots of particles combined in random fashion and human beings evolved through that process of random combinations of pieces of matter, but there's no meaning behind it. It's just all randomness. And then when the body dies, our consciousness, our sense of being dies as well. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I used to think about life, that there's no real meaning. Uh, mm -hmm. But now I think about life very differently where I think of consciousness as the, the fundamental aspect of reality. And it's actually beyond the body. The body sort of houses consciousness, but it doesn't create it. So with that perspective, if consciousness, and, and my first book is the science behind this, but if we assume that science is correct and there is consciousness beyond this body and that we're sort of interconnected, in this consciousness, then how would we look at life? And that's really what the second book examines. Well, you know, look, you in your first book, Paranormal Near-Death Experiences, uh, was a long way away from a guy at Princeton doing what you were doing in the business world, right? Um, and to actually take a deep dive into that, I just want to congratulate you because the reality is um, it takes a lot of courage and faith to step out on that track. And you state that the purpose of the book is to explore with precision where we should set our life's compass. You just mentioned that. Um, how do we find an orientation that most closely aligns, uh, as you say in the book, it really closely aligns, this uh, find an orientation, an orientation which is the true nature of reality, right? Um, and why is our reality off the mark in your estimation? In other words, you know, I, we could say that about a lot of people. I mean, I'm going to say a political comment who voted for Trump, right? And we could say, where is their reality, right? And, you, and it's really an interesting thing when you start to look at human behavior and how it's affected by all the resources that are thrown at us. Right. In other words, the news media and the Internet and paranormal experiences and all these things that are floating around in people's heads. How do you expect them to get to some sense of whatever this new reality should be? Yeah. Well, it's a challenge. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. And there are limitations of the human mind. I think that in the same way that we can't comprehend the concept of infinity, but we accept that it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. There are probably similar aspects of reality that we will never be able to calculate in our minds. So that makes it a challenging issue. But I think if we're setting a compass for our lives, meaning how, what's the overall intention of, of everything that we do in our, in, in our life, the, there is an underlying set of assumptions that each of us has about what life is, who and what we are, whether or not there's meaning. If there is meaning, what is that meaning? So in this book, I, I try to set out, at least for me, what the answers to those questions are. And mm -hmm. the, the overarching thesis is that we are all interconnected as part of a singular consciousness. And we're sort of like dissociated aspects of the same consciousness. Or as the philosopher, Dr. Bernardo Castrop says, it's like we are whirlpools within an overall stream of consciousness. So we have this sense of being an individual, but we're actually not really an individual because we're part of the same stream. And that's well, the you, foundational principle for me. Well, you say that this all starts with separation, um, the separation versus the interconnectedness. And you know, that's the ego mind. That's part of everybody. That's our individual um, identity that's tied up in that, our ego that wants to say, hey, Mark is great, Greg is great, whatever it might be. Um, what, why do you believe that as a species, we started to believe in, in that overall separation? Um, and, and rather than separation, how would we kind of move toward this new world view, view of interconnectedness? I'm glad you mentioned separation because I think that's one of the big assumptions in society, which I think is incorrect, and it leads to many, if not all of the world's problems, the belief that we are fundamentally separate, that we are, we live on the same planet, we have similar genetics because we're human beings and we're part of the same species, but there's no interconnectedness really beyond that. And what I'm arguing, and many others have made this argument as well, is that we are at a level of reality that we don't see with our eyes, a deeper level of reality. We're actually facets of the same exact thing. 
we are literally each other in some respect, but we are um, sort of diverse aspects of the same unity. And that's a very different perspective than the one that I used to have. And I think different than the perspective that's promoted in the education system and probably in the media and many aspects of society that, that promotes this separation, not always explicitly, but it's sort of an underlying assumption. And because of that, because of the assumption of separation, that leads to many forms of conflict and less unity. Mm -hmm. oh, well, we see that happening with inside of our own country. Um, we see, we've seen that happen in many countries. Now, what I love about your book is your book is really about your journey, but validating your journey um, along the way. And, you know, you tell a great story about growing up in this Jewish family that had the traditions of Judaism. And I love this story because it exemplifies Christianity, Judaism. It doesn't matter which religion it is. You just happen to use Judaism as the example. Um, where the traditions were so seeped in the family, you know, that you were supposed to follow this path. This is what you had to believe, you know. Um, I always tell that story about uh, Mark, and you can, you can see this. At, at Christmas time, the daughter and the mother were in the kitchen, and the, the, the mother would cut the end of the ham off and put it into the, the baking pan. And the daughter would ask the mother, well, why did you cut off the end of the ham, the bait, the ham fits in there just fine. She says, well, because my mother always did that when, when, in other words, her grandmother would have cut off the end of the hand. And, the only, and then she went to grandma and asked her and she said, only reason I cut it off is because it wouldn't fit in the pan. Right. So the reality is, is it's that kind of process that starts. And, you know, you said that the family was so steep, yet you were being educated at Princeton, which taught you critical thinking skills, right? Uh, any of the universities are going to choose this. Uh, this truly was a dichotomy for, for anybody. It's a dichotomy anywhere. You got people going to great universities, yet they're brought up in all these traditions, and there's this dichotomy. What did you learn from the experience, and why should religious beliefs be questioned? And speak about, if you would, Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. I thought that was a great example. Sure. So growing up in a, in a traditional Jewish family, I would say that, that the religion itself was not a huge part of the upbringing, but there were probably certain cultural just uh, things that were passed down or certain belief yeah. systems that I didn't even think to question because they were just part of living. But I, I actually never, I never bought into it too much. I kind of went along with it for a while, but the more I learned in school, in high school, and then in college and then going on beyond that I questioned things more and more right. and what I what I thought I was learning in really what science was pointing toward is that religions were sort of like superstitions that comforted people because they didn't want to face the inevitability of having to die in a random universe and that that belief became more and more uh, prevalent in my life that there is no meaning People could have their religious beliefs and they're allowed to do that, but I think that's that's a delusion, like like Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. Mm -hmm. It's all about mm -hmm. that idea of, of why human beings would be would gravitate toward religion. It would mm -hmm. make sense psychologically to try to latch onto something, but beyond that, there's no validity to it. So the more I learned, the more I rejected the conventional belief systems around belief, around religion and spirituality. Yeah, and now you state that you had this fundamental belief in the metaphysical philosophy of physicalism. Uh, you call it physicalism in this book. Um, if you would, can you define for the listeners what that is and, and then why your beliefs have changed? I call it physicalism in this book because in the, in the past book and in scientific circles, that they sometimes call it materialism. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to confuse people between just being materialistic in a like trying to buy a fancy car or something versus um, what I'm talking about here is the scientific idea that everything is, is made of physical stuff, physical matter, and consciousness and life arises from that matter. So I'm a human being made of atoms of matter. And that's all I am. Consciousness just emerges from my brain. And that's why I'm conscious right now. And I have this awareness. And once the body dies, that consciousness goes away. So physicalism, materialism, they start with matter. And consciousness comes at the end when you combine the matter in a specific way. 
And when the matter isn't configured that way anymore, when it, the machine turns off, there's no consciousness. Mm -hmm. so, um, what I'm arguing for in both books is, is the reverse, actually. That consciousness comes first, in a sense, and everything that we observe in the world through our senses is emerging within a consciousness. And the philosopher, or the, the, the physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist, he said, in truth, there is only one mind. And that's the idea that I'm talking about, a, a singular consciousness that is beyond the body. So with that worldview shift, all of a sudden, wait a second, I am more than my body. I might be interconnected with th things in a way that, that I didn't realize. Maybe my consciousness continues after my body dies. I have to rethink things a lot. And that's been the journey for me. So what would you call that one consciousness? Because a lot of people are going to say, hey, Mark, you know, that's God. That's the, that's the universal mind. That's There's a lot of words for it out there. Look, I've been doing interviews on spirituality and personal growth and all this for well, 15 years now, but been in the, the field for longer than that. So what... What definition do you give it? Because people like to put wrappers around things. Yeah. I mean, calling it consciousness is is one thing, but it's so etherical to say consciousness. It's so, um, I'm not going to say undescript. It is descript, the term consciousness. Yet a lot of people can't get their hands around it. It's like, what is consciousness? Right. And that's one of the challenges, because when I'm referring to consciousness, I'm talking about something that's beyond space and time and is so abstract that we can't really define it. And when we try to define it, that's putting a limit on something that I would argue is infinite and limitless. Okay. So the, the, the question is, it's a good question and it's a very difficult one to answer. So I've, I've used the term consciousness many times and I, and I use it often because it's, it does not sound overtly spiritual. And I know that sometimes people who are just getting into this space will be have kind of a knee-jerk negative reaction to anything that sounds spiritual. But for those who are more accustomed to the spiritual language, one could use the term God as a synonym for this universal consciousness or universal mind. I think they're all, they're all describing the same thing. One of the issues I've had with the term God in the past is that it sometimes seems to refer to an external being that almost seems like a, like a, a anthropomorphized human that is fundamentally separate. Right. And what I'm arguing and many mystical traditions also argue is that this notion of one mind or God is not only transcendent beyond, but it's also within. So it's right. the whirlpool within the stream. The whirlpool is also made of water. And so I want to be clear on what I'm talking about here is that we are individually a part of that universal consciousness and not separate from it. I always, uh, uh, I didn't say debate, but disagreed with the concept that, you know, there was a judging God. There is no judging God in my estimation. And we all are, if you're going to use it, consciousness. So we all are God uh, in in reality here. So you, would, you have a great uh, appreciation. I love this statement because Alan Watts is one of my favorites. He says, if the universe, he says, if the universe is meaningless, so is the statement that is so. Um, speak with us about your beliefs in the evolution of consciousness. It's one thing to say consciousness. It's another thing to say um, there are souls on this planet because if you look at Ken Wilber, it's lines and levels and everybody vibrates at a different level. So now you talk about vib vibrational level, which is different levels of consciousness. So as, as species and human beings, we obviously have people that are different levels of consciousness. Um, I would say the people that attack the capital probably have a different level of consciousness about what they believe. And that belief is not vibrating in harmony and in balance, right? Let's face it, you know, I can make that political comment. This is my show. So the, the point is, is that... Um, how, in your estimation, does over time uh, this consciousness evolve? What's, what's required? Or do you believe that we're, uh, we come into this world and we're given this level of consciousness and whatever it is, it is? I don't believe that, but I believe we can evolve it. 
Yes. So the short answer is that I, I do think we can evolve it. And that's part of the purpose of the universe is, is for all of us to evolve individually and collectively. I'll start with your, your comment about Al, the Alan Watts statements, that if the universe is meaningless and so is the statement, it is so. That, for, that was actually one of the things that I did understand when I thought life had no meaning is that I would say, wait a second, why do I care so much to, to have a, this belief that life doesn't mean anything? because it doesn't mean anything anyway, so what, what's the point of even arguing about it? And I, I remember listening to lots of atheists talk about how life has no meaning and how religion is a delusion. Right. And then I would think to myself, well, what, what is the point of having that debate even if there is no meaning to life because it's, the debate itself is meaningless? So that's where I was going with that statement. Uh, but with regard to the evolution of consciousness, I wanna take a few steps back. So within this idea of the one mind, God, universal consciousness, um, I view reincarnation to be a part of that, mm -hmm. at least at the level where we appear to be separate. And I, I, I look at research from the University of Virginia, over 2,500 cases of children who remember past lives and sometimes have birthmarks and physical defects that align with the alleged past life. Some really compelling stuff there. Um, it's interesting you say that because it's so, it's so, not to interrupt you, and I did, but last night I was watching on Netflix this, all the stories about the uh, children who reincarnated, one of them, remember, if you remember, he was a fighter pilot. And the only thing he could do would be was flying in the plane, right? And then this other guy came back as this actor and he really remembered. But once they reach adolescence, they forget those memories. So when they're children, it's like they're playing them out, playing them out. You know, all this research has been done because... This is a fascinating documentary. It went everywhere where everybody's studying the metaphysics of this and what's happening in near-death experiences and the whole nine yards. So um, you obviously have been studying a lot of this yourself. Uh, so going back to that, you know, speak with us about this evolutionary part, because if we do come in again and again and again, and you believe in reincarnation, that means that is our evolution. We're, we're supposed to evolve each time we come in. Sometimes I would say we probably don't, but, but is that a belief that you have? It, I would say generally it is. That the, okay. the body that we currently have is a, a mechanism of evolution. We are born into a certain family and certain life circumstances, have certain experiences, and all of those are geared toward our learning and growth at the level of our consciousness, which exists after the body. So what the way I think about it is that our, our body is not something that we take with us, but the consciousness and our learnings, that, that goes with us beyond the body. Right. And I also point to the life review phenomenon in the near-death experience. So a near-death experience is an instance where a person has some kind of physiological trauma. So let's say someone is in cardiac arrest, the heart stops beating, blood stops flowing to the brain. And yet in many of these cases, people after they're resuscitated talk about uh, being immersed in unconditional love. They talk about sometimes other dimensions, seeing beings of light, deceased relatives. And sometimes what they see, they'll see something in the room, like they're hovering over their body in an out-of-body experience. And the things that they witnessed upon being resuscitated are validated by doctors in the room or other people that were not in the near-death experience state. So that lends more credibility to these claims that they're not just hallucinations. So I give that preface because one of the experiences people often talk about is reviewing their whole life in the mm -hmm. state when their brain's knocked out and yet they are able to relive their, their whole life. And going back to your statement about judgment, there, there seems to be this process where the individual is observing how he or she acted. So it's not a third party judging, it's the individual seeing how he or she did in certain instances. And often people report that the little things are the big things. So they'll see how they treated a cashier in line. And if they mistreated the cashier or just weren't that friendly, they might see how the cashier then was in a, in a worse mood with everyone else in the line later on. And you can see the rippling effects. So the, the story that has stuck with me most in the life review, and this gets back to the evolutionary question, is that of Daniel Brinkley, who has had four near-death experiences and each time remembered a life review. And when I interviewed him for my podcast, Where Is My Mind, he told me about going back to his memories of, of combat in Vietnam. 
when he, he told me that he was vicious, he killed people, that's what he did in combat. And in his life reviews, he had to relive the deaths of the people that he killed. And he also relived the pain of the child that would lo no longer have a father because he had murdered the father. So he felt the indirect effects. And when he came back into his body, like many other near-death experiencers, he changed his life drastically. He became a hospice volunteer. So yeah, in his he's later- been, He's been by the bedside of over a thousand people who passed away. He's the guy who was electrocuted all those times, right? His yeah, first hit by lightning. Yeah, he was hit by lightning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, he's got a fascinating story. And for those of you who haven't seen him, I've actually seen him speak in person. He's a, he's a very lively guy as well. So yeah, so go ahead with the story. Yeah, so in his later uh, near-death experiences and life reviews, he got to see his, his own evolution. So he got to witness what it was like to be the veteran dying in, in the hospice looking at Daniel. So he got to see what it was like to be that person and being comforted by him. So this is a, a long way of saying that the, the near-death experience combined with the reincarnation research suggests that we are here to evolve, first mm -hmm. and foremost. Mm -hmm. So when we look at life with that lens, it, it, it might reprioritize things for us. We see that with people who come back from a near-death experience. They don't care about material stuff as much. They don't care how big right. their house is. And often they get divorced or they change their friend groups because their priorities shift. So I, I think the near-death experience is a neat window into the nature of reality and why we're here. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, the, the closer you examine your finitude, whether even without having a near-death experience, if you guess, just use some contemplation and then start to read about these things, um, you open up your consciousness to, to new opportunities to explore and to who you want to become and who you want to be. Uh, and you start living your life differently. Um, the deeper you get into it, you're a perfect example. You haven't had a near-death experience, yet you did all this research because you were questioning. And I think uh, the questioning mind is the one that will oftentimes uh, embark on this journey. So you mentioned that no one has any idea of how consciousness could come out of a brain, yet consciousness is formless and subjective where our brain is physical and tangible. And that's what you've said so far up till now. Um, what in your estimation is consciousness and how does it manifest? In other words, here we are, you said that we're all part of this one big consciousness yet we're all these little mini consciousnesses running around, right? And we, we will be reunited as part of that one consciousness, of that unification of the larger one, right? Because that's where we came from. Um, but um, how does this manifest? Well, the body is, and the brain are, are related to the way that we experience life. They're related to consciousness. I view the brain as a filtering mechanism of this broader consciousness. So a near-death experience is a good example. When the brain is knocked out of the way, when the person's body isn't functioning, the, the sense of consciousness is expanded. Right. People talk about an enriched reality. The same thing happens in, in studies on psychedelics. When parts of the brain are actually uh, have a reduction in functioning during the psychedelic trip when people have these ultra real experiences. And there are many cases like this where you have less brain, more consciousness. So it's like when we are in these individuated pods of a body, the consciousness is filtered in a way that we have a very specific experience and that is helping to stimulate evolution. So it seems that this one consciousness uses the physical world to have perhaps an infinite diversity of experiences because the experience of Mark is different than the experience of Greg, which is different than the experience of any other being. It is, it is definitely, as, as you state in the book, um, I believe this, this evolution of consciousness, this, we're here to evolve this in this incarnation, right? We're here to become better people, uh, no matter how many other reincarnations we've had before. Um, so you write in the book that, and I thought this was very important to bring up, you know, you were this hard driving tennis player, maniac achieving kind of person, right? You mentioned that it was expected that you get married, you have kids, and then you die, right? Mm -hmm. Um, 
what are your beliefs in spirituality or higher power and in your finitude and comment on your heart stopping at your desk and being overstressed and overworked because I don't know if that was a near death experience, but it was certainly a panic attack. Uh, I don't know how, how bad that really was, but you know, you were stressed out beyond belief the reason you are where you are, in my estimation, after reading both of these books, is that you um, you chose not to live that life as a result of the pain associated with what was being inflicted on you. And you didn't want to have that pain anymore. That's my personal commentary, because I had similar experiences. I went down a different road as a result of tremendous amounts of stress affecting my physical body, which then manifested in me saying, uh, do I really have to endure this pain? Uh, tell us, you know, a, a bit about this from your perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just going with the flow of, of how others around me were acting, which, is, which was all based on achievement. Mm -hmm. So do well in school, get good grades, get a good job, all that, the, the traditional path. Right. But I didn't have any sense of meaning beyond that. So I was, I was just doing the next thing that seemed like it made sense because others around me were doing it. And I, I basically, I hit a wall. I probably hit lots of little walls along the way, but it really got bad um, several years ago. But when it, you mentioned the, the event when I was in investment banking in New York, this was because it was during the financial crisis, it was even more intense than usual. There were layoffs all the time. I was in the group that was responsible for advising financial institutions. So my clients were banks and insurance companies and all the companies that were having problems. So there was urgency everywhere. And I, I wasn't sleeping. That's, that's typical in investment banking and more exaggerated during that period. So I would go sometimes literally months without a day off, including weekends. And I remember when I first started working, if I left the office before 2 a.m., that was a good day. That's just how it was. And that, that was the expectation. And it was voluntary. So I was signing up for this. I could have left any time. And there was a period, um, a year plus in, where I remember I was working on a financial model and one of the my supervisors came by my desk late at night. I don't, it might've been 2 a.m. or something like that. And my heart started fluttering and it, it didn't quite stop, but I sort of passed out at my desk for a split second. And then I saw a doctor and the doctor said, sort of what you said, Greg, which is that it's you need to just calm down with your lifestyle. Your heart is okay, but you need to chill out. Um, but I, I didn't stop at that point. I mean, I ended up leaving the firm and joining another firm, which had a, a bit of a better lifestyle. But in the beginning, when I was low on the totem pole, I was still working very hard and still just focused on these achievements that were immediately in front of me. And it, it, I came to a point in 2014-ish and 2015 where a lot of things in life, including um, – the things with my business, a few deals I was working on didn't go my way. A few things in my personal life weren't going my way. And behind all of it, I didn't know why any of it mattered. So I was incredibly lost at this point. And I, I didn't think I was looking for something explicitly. I happened to come across these podcasts and found things that I was interested in. I started to question a lot of metaphysical topics and, and here I am now. It's, it's, a, it's a path that many people take. Uh, and I will say that it uh, frequently will start with enduring uh, whatever kind of pain it is or physical challenge that happens in their life uh, to get them to shift. Um, studies show that people will uh, shift and then a lot of times they'll shift back. There isn't permanent change. It's temporary. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, it was MIT or one of the universities did studies on people who had had heart attacks and they said you need to change your diet you need to change your exercise program and you need to meditate you need to do all these things and yet 93 percent of them never sustain them um so they fall back into the same patterns um so what is it that you'd want the readers to take away from the end of upside down living if you were to kind of summation of this book summation of what the people who are listening right now could take away from this. Um, obviously, they can go up and listen to your podcast. They can get copies of your book. Um, but what would be, if you were to encapsulate this and go, okay, this is what I want everybody to know. What would you tell them to take away? 
Well, the end of the book answers the question that the book starts with, which is the question I pose, what is the overall intention of your life? So I think just by asking that question and thinking hard about it for each of us individually, that's a very positive thing. And where I end up after going through the logic is that ultimately we're here to be the best version of ourselves that we can be, to perfect ourselves so that we can be of service. We can be a vessel for this universal consciousness for whatever intelligence it has in mind. And I think we, be, we are of service in the best capacity for the whole when we perfect ourselves. Yeah, and the contributions that we make. I think the key right. is um, look at things that you can do that you haven't done before that could make a difference in the world. Uh, the more lives you help by what you're doing, Mark, writing books, doing a podcast, uh, disseminating information that people might not otherwise get, uh, you're helping people shift things in their life or even think about shifting things in their life because sometimes it takes a, a lot longer to get there. So I want to commend you for the journey and, as I said at the beginning of this podcast, for your ability to and willingness to share it and express it because it does take a lot of courage to come out and talk about it. Um, you could have stayed hidden and worked for Sherpa the rest of your life and done whatever, <clears throat> but you've chosen an alternative path. I'm sure there's many out there that think you're totally crazy uh, for doing what you did. People say that to me all the time. Why do you do this podcast show? You could make a lot more money doing whatever. I've been doing it for 14 years and I haven't taken a dime from it. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. Um, and uh, all my listeners, <clears throat> I, I don't know if they know this or not yet, but all the money that comes in from ads that authors buy from the show, we're giving it all away now to people in need, 100%. Wow. Um, and I'm supporting the show through the other revenue that I have coming in. So um, that is our goal this next year. What we want to do is give away um, thirty thousand dollars to people that are in need, a thousand at a time, uh, to help them on their path toward recovery. So we're working with the San Diego Rescue Mission. We're working with Solutions for Change. We're finding individuals. And the interesting thing is a little commercial here right now. We actually interview them and we're putting them up at YouTube. We're having our listeners vote on which ones are the most needy. Um, and that's kind of how we're choosing to give the money away to whom and why. Wow. So a new little mission for me for Compassionate Communications Foundation. And Mark, we appreciate having you on. Everybody who's listening, go to Mark Gober, G-O-B-E-R.com. There you will find it. It's real easy. M-A-R-K-G-O-B-E-R.com. You can learn more about Mark, his book, his interviews, his podcast. Namaste to you, Mark. Thanks for being on on this uh, Martin Luther King Day, the 18th of January. Thank you, Greg. And thanks for all that you're doing.